Okay, welcome to unit four. We're going to be studying um, drag, resistive forces. We've held on to this until now because, uh, not in this lecture, but in the next one, we're getting into some pretty heavy calculus, some integration. Um, so this one's pretty easy, this one's pretty short. And then after drag, we're going to get into momentum. Momentum and center of mass using calculus. Right. So let's, let's just get into it now. So 6.4b, day one. Um, most of the time in first year physics, you did not take drag into account. You didn't take air resistance into account. Everything was just uh, no air resistance. In the real world, there is air resistance. And even though we still do a lot of things in our magical, imaginary physics land, and it's all theory, we do want to look at at least the theory of air resistance and air drag and see how it works. So without air resistance, the graphs for uh, position, velocity, and acceleration versus time look like this. If, if down is positive, by the way, right? So down is positive. That's what we have. Constant acceleration, um, constantly increasing velocity, so a straight line, and a parabolic curve for the position as a function of time. But with uh, air resistance, it's different, right? When, when you're dealing with high speeds, generally, um, the amount of drag force that's there is proportional to the square of the velocity. And this is the Crave equation that's on your packet, right? D equals one half Crave, C rho A V squared. And it's, you got, don't forget the one half, right? So D, this is the force of drag, the drag force. That's what D stands for. Equals C rho, or one half C rho A V squared. So it's Crave, but don't forget the half and the squared at the end. C. C is the coefficient of air resistance. And this depends on the fluid through which the thing is moving and the nature of the surface itself. So it's a very smooth surface that'll be less, right? If, um, if it's a very rough surface of so something like a tennis ball, it's more. Rho is the uh, density of the object, or the density of the, it's the density of the air where it is. Um, density of the environment, the fluid, whatever it is. And then A is the cross-sectional area of the object. So if we have something that's spherical, that's falling, what we care about, A, represents this. You know, we'd have to find this, the area of this circle here as it's falling. Okay, the, uh, that horizontal cross-sectional area. And then V, obviously, is the velocity, right? So the force varies, the drag force varies as a function of time. One of the things we're going to be doing here is finding what is the terminal velocity. As things fall, they, uh, the force, the drag force increases, and at some point we reach a place where the force of gravity is equal to the drag force. At this point now, it reaches a velocity and it just stays there. It's not going to increase anymore. There's no more acceleration because these two forces are equal. The net force is zero. So when something is first dropped, force of gravity is pulling on it, it has no velocity, and so that's what the free body diagram looks like. As it's speeding up, here's the force of gravity, but the drag force is less than this. That means this is still accelerating. And then at some point it gets to this place where um, these two forces cancel out. The acceleration graph then is going to look something like this. Acceleration versus time. We're going to get into that a lot more in the next lecture, but just so you can see it now, that's what it looks like. And so if I know this, though, if I'm asking about the terminal velocity, at terminal velocity, that's when Fg is equal to Fd. When the uh, gravitational force is equal to the drag force, that means that the gravitational force is equal to 1 half C rho A V squared. So if I know C rho and A, then I can solve for V if I know what Fg is, if I know the mass of the object, if I know the weight of it. Okay, and that's what our first example is. Um, here we have example one, a falling cat. Why a cat? I don't know. Falling cat reaches a terminal speed of 97 kilometers per hour while it is tucked in and then stretches out, doubling A. So how fast is it moving when it reaches a new terminal speed? So we know the terminal speed at one time. Now we want to know what's the terminal speed at another time if this doubles, right? 
Uh, and so we have one value for v. So v, what is v equal to? v is equal to um, 2 fg over c rho a, the square root of that. Right, but what I'm doing now is I'm doubling a. This I know is equal to 97 kilometers per hour. But when I double a, that means I'm multiplying this by um, 1 over root 2. Okay, so 97 times the square root of 1 half is 68.6. kilometers per hour. Okay, don't need to know anything else there, just knowing how A, the cross-sectional area, is proportional to the velocity, which we can solve for from this equation and find. Okay, next example uh, is a little bit more involved. Okay, so here I want to know what is the terminal speed of this drop given these conditions. Well, if I solve for V like I did before, we're talking about terminal speed, so we're talking about the place here where the drag force is equal to the gravitational force. So I plug in gravitational force. When I solve for V, I end up with 2 Fg over C rho A, where rho is this, the rho of air. Um, and so, in order to find Fg, though, I need to know the mass. And I can get the mass from using this information here. Right. Um, so I know that rho of water is equal to the mass per volume. Right. And I know the volume of this thing. The volume I can calculate from R. So M is equal to r, which is 1.5 times 10 to the, I'm sorry, rho. Rho is uh, 1.2, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And the volume of this drop is uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed, and r is 1.5 times 10 to the negative third. So we're going to cube that. So then this tells me that the force of gravity, uh, multiply this by 10, I'm going to 1.39 times 10 to the negative fourth. I also need to know the cross-sectional area. So area is 2 pi r. r is 1.5 times 10 to the negative third. Um, rather, a is pi r squared, sorry. And so this is 7.06 times 10 to the negative sixth. Uh, square meters. This is in Newtons. So I plug these numbers in here, and so I get 2 times the square root of all this, 2 times 1.39 times 10 to the negative third, or 10 to the negative fourth, sorry, looked at the wrong line over there, over C, which is 0.6, times rho, rho of air, which is 1.2, and then A, which is 7.06 times 10 to the negative sixth. Right. And when you put all that in, what we end up with is 7.15 meters per second. Right. So it's really not moving all that fast. But let's see what it would be like if there was no air resistance. If there is no air resistance for part B, we're just using VFTAD so we can say that VF squared equals 2A delta Y. A is G in this case. Right, so V is going to be the square root of 2 times 10 times, and it's dropped from 1,200 meters 
this comes out to 153 meters per second. So it's a lot nicer to be outside in the rain when the raindrops are moving 7.15 meters per second instead of 153 meters per second. And that's it for this lesson.